Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here, too. And this is Stuff You Should Know, the the little close-to-home edition. Yeah, right? In two ways. One is that, uh, as podcasters, we are on one end of the parasocial relationship uh, relationship? Correct, yes. <laughs> and the other is, like, I have these. I don't know if you do or not, but I have parasocial relationships of my own with podcasts. I don't have any because I'm sane. Right. <laughs> oh. I'm totally kidding. I don't think I have any. No, I don't have any. I think what it is, is it has nothing to do with sanity. My imagination is just not that vivid. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Because I think for for this to, to set... You have to be able to imagine yourself like in the room um, with the p- people you're listening to, for example, or what you would do after they stopped filming the TV show or something like that. Like any, you're, you're big into comedy. Any of your big comedian people that you love, you, you know, never think like, God, we would be friends if we knew no, each other. No, I really don't. I don't. <laughs> I feel like deficient because of it, but I genuinely no. do not have any parasocial relationship that I can bring to mind. And I don't remember ever having that. I think I just assumed that they wouldn't like me rather than they oh. would like me, which makes it much harder to have a parasocial relationship with somebody you just assume you wouldn't get along with very well. Uh, well, then by some estimates, you're part of the 49% of people, mm-hmm. that of Americans, that is, that do not have parasocial relationships. And if you're yelling at, us right now because we haven't defined it yet. Just a wait. parasocial relationship is a, it's like when you listen to a podcast mm-hmm. and you think, I know those guys. They're like my friends. We would be so, we would be such good friends in real life. It's a one sided relationship uh, between a consumer of a thing, a fan of a thing, mm-hmm. and a public figure. Yeah. And one of those papers you sent me, I saw it described rather aptly as a um, one sided intimacy at a distance. Mm, yeah. And in our go go be normal as much as you can type society. Uh-huh. Um that sounds a little like off base, a little weird, a little out there. To some people I should say, to others you it's like well yeah, of course this is normal life. But um we we should say like there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It can no. go wrong. Yeah. As we'll see. But at its base, having a parasocial relationship does not make you a loser, a loner, social misfit, um, a weirdo. It actually makes you slightly healthier emotionally, intellectually, in my opinion. Yeah. And as we'll talk about, studies bear that out that it's, uh, you know, I think they they put it at generally about three to five percent of the time it can go south, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about that kind of stuff when it becomes obsessive and stuff like that. Stand, but yeah, for the other ninety five to ninety eight percent of people, it actually provides quite a benefit because it makes someone it makes someone feel good and it makes people laugh a lot of times. And I feel like comedy a lot of times is what you associate more. I'm sure you can have parasocial relationships with like. Uh, Peter Jennings or something. Sure. Or Dan Rather. I'm sure that happens. <laughs> it would be harder, <laughs> ge- though, as we'll see. <laughs> you generally think of it in terms of, like, uh, either a podcast or a TV show when you when you would sit around and you would think about, uh, uh, which friend are, am I or which uh, Sex in the City character? You're such a Miranda. Right. Like, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here when people identify so much that it's like a real relationship. Yes. And I want to say I am in that very unusual and unique position, as are you and as are most that you're podcasters. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. I totally am a Miranda. Um, actually, no, what's the other one's name who is married to um, uh, Kyle McLaughlin? I feel like oh, I uh, identify more with her. Yeah, uh, Charlotte. Charlotte. Yeah, I'm a total Charlotte. Um, what I was going to say, though, is... Um, I'm in the unique position of being on the opposite side of a parasocial relationship. That's a very rare place to be. And I can tell you that I do enjoy hearing about that. Like when we're at live shows and people tell us like where they, they think of us as like their friends or whatever. I always sure. love to hear that kind of thing. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. 
So I don't, I don't want to, I don't engage them myself, but when yeah, yeah. Uh, they are thrust upon me, I'm like, oh yeah, I love that. Yeah. And we feel the same way uh, generally. And most times when we meet listeners who are awesome like that, we, we, if we did know each other, there's a good chance we might be friends. Yeah. I think that's another thing too, is, is I think that's kind of like that, that um, weirdo view of it. Like the, the irony of it is they're so far off base that like if they ever actually did meet the person mm-hmm. in real life, they would be horribly crushed and maybe even mocked. Um, I mean, it, at least from our experience, most people who do come up and tell us that they think of us as friends do seem like people we would probably hang out with in real life. Totally. There's also, and I'll t- talk about this a little bit, I guess, later, but uh, I'm in a situation where a lot of the podcasts that I consume are comedy podcasts where I do kind of know the person. Oh, okay. But that's a quasi-parasocial relationship because <laughs> I find myself thinking I'm better friends with them than I am when, in fact, they are just industry colleagues that are loose pals, perhaps. But I think, like, oh, yeah. Me and Scott Ackerman are like great friends because we have so much in common. <laughs> yeah, he does not think that. And Scott's a great guy, super nice. He's always been very nice. I'll be on his shows occasionally. We both worked with him a little bit. But we're not great friends, even though I feel like we are because I listen to so much of his stuff. Okay. I'm glad you, so, you so named check somebody. I was going to ask you who you have parasocial relationships with, but I feel like quasi-parasocial relationship is very uh-huh. niche. Yeah, probably so. So let's let's begin at the beginning. Um, these things haven't been around forever, mostly because they're a product of media communications. Mm-hmm. They would not exist otherwise because without media, you would actually be interacting with this person face to face. And that's the big rub of the whole thing is that other person is on the other side of a screen. They're in yeah. your, your headphones. They're not there physically, but the, the way that they present themselves to you tricks us into um, becoming friends with them or um, having an affinity for them just as you would if you met them in real life. And the whole thing is traced back to a couple of sociologists named Donald Horton and Richard Wall, who back in the 50s started noticing that people would actually talk back to their TV mm-hmm. and that they, as sociologists, they said, this is interesting. That's kind of unusual <laughs> and probably These new. people don't understand TV. And I think I'm sure it existed before in radio, but yeah. as we'll see, um, media has added to itself, added to itself, added to itself over the generations, over the, the last you know half century or so, um, to make it more likely that you're going to have a, a parasocial relationship with somebody in media um, and a deeper one, too. But the whole thing started with TV and people shouting at it. And what they coined was a term called parasocial interactions. Yeah, and that's, uh, I think TV also was... All of a sudden, you had a couple of other ingredients to the recipe that could spawn uh, a parasocial relationship, which is uh, repeated, consistent faces uh, that you're seeing. It's not like, you know, going to a movie, which you could do before the, you know, 1956. Uh, That person being in your uh, house, in your living room every week or even every night was a different thing. Uh, And they were talking to you. They were looking at your face. uh, And there were new kinds of media personalities that they hadn't seen before, which is uh, like game show host, talk show host, newscasters, people looking into the camera and talking to you, the home audience. And that changed things. And they were fascinated by what they called this relationship between what they uh, dubbed personae, who are, you know, the Dan Rathers or whatever. I don't know why Dan Rathers is so on the tip of my brain. Hmm. What's he even doing these days? He's writing and stuff, right? I don't, I don't know. It's been a while. I haven't heard from think, him in a while. He hasn't called me back. I think he's <laughs> I think he's pretty active uh, on social media and stuff. Anyway, um, it was a new thing where there were people in your room, these personae, talking to your family. And it was there was a lot of small talk that had never been around before, like on the news when you – uh, you know how newscasters are. They, they've, we've talked about it in the, the Weather Person episode. Right. The change to like the more familiar banter and small talk and, you know, let's talk about uh, our lives a little bit even. All of a sudden people are being let in. Yes. And that's a, a product of the whole thing. Like that's purposeful. And what the whole thing creates is the illusion of intimacy. And that Which is, I disagree with, by the way. What? That it's an illusion? 
Well, yeah. I mean, that's what Horton and Wall called it. I think it's a type of intimacy. Okay. So what would you call it? Intimacy A type of intimacy. (laughs) One-way intimacy, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I'll agree with you on that for sure. All right. I think these guys were just like, what the heck is going on? So yeah, they kind of- Sure. It's the 1950s. I get it. They weren't. Yeah. So um, we'll we'll just call it this type of intimacy um, or one-sided intimacy. And like I was saying, like they they purposely cultivated this as they started not not Wall and Horton, but um, pr- TV producers found out very quickly that like people would write letters to you know their favorite newscaster or their favorite mm-hmm. soap opera character or something like that. That was kind of new. Again, people would yell at the radio um, or they would listen to a specific news announcer on the radio or something like that. That happened before, but that whole thing of being able to look at you, of being Mm -hmm. able to talk to you directly, seemingly, again, it triggers something in us that radio could never do. Yeah. And like you said, I I think I cut you off. You were talking about the fact that it wasn't an accident. They, They worked on this. They were told to look directly into the camera lens and they were told to make Uh, small talk and have friendly banter between each other and to have a, like a friendly tone. It was all engineered to get people to watch you more. It wasn't engineered. So parasocial relationships would form, but that was a byproduct of them trying to get their game show host or their newscaster to uh, connect with an audience. Right. So some other things they would do is um, characters would be boiled down into kind of thumbnail sketches of yeah. a person. So you have like Joey, who's kind of like the ditzy one, or Gracie right. Gracie Allen was the original, I think, kind of ditz on TV. Um, and when she entered the room or when Joey entered a scene, you knew something like hilarious was going to happen because they were just so ditzy. And in right. that sense, you know Joey. Like, you don't know Matt LeBlanc at all. You know right. Joey, the character that Matt LeBlanc is playing. Uh, How are you doing? Exactly. You know he's probably <laughs> going to say something like that. He's going to like right. go after some girl or something like that. You can predict his actions, which means that you have um, some sort of relationship with him and in, in that you, you recognize his personality and you accept it and you can predict it. And that in and of itself is a level of intimacy. Yeah, and you don't even necessarily have to identify with that particular character. Mm-hmm. I think in the case of something like, Friends or Sex in the City, a lot of people just said, hey, this is like my group of friends. And Joey is like my friend Josh. And uh, Chandler is like uh, my other friend and that kind of thing. I got you. Wait, who? I'm I'm like who? I was talking about a different Josh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, said, I said you're like Joey, but you're not like any of the friends. Uh, no, no. I'm not. Maybe a bit of a bit of a Rachel. I don't know. <laughs> kind of happy about that. <laughs> We're going with Friends and Sex in the City for the rest of the episode, huh? I guess so. Uh, Another thing that we did on our own very show was uh, that they did back then to engineer this kind of connection was um, call-in shows, uh, reading fan mail on the air, stuff like that, interacting with the audience, which is obviously ramped up in the day of social media, which uh, we'll get to because that's a whole different ball of wax these days. Yes. Um, And one of the the reasons that Horton and Wall created a new term for what the person is, who the person is having a parasocial <coughs> relationship with, personae or a persona, um, mm-hmm. is because that's not, again, it's not a real person. Even if they're not playing a character and, you know, the right. newscaster is playing himself, the newscaster, he's not mm-hmm. talking about like the horrible fight he and his wife had the day before. Right. And, like he didn't get sure. much sleep and he's not really feeling good. He's never going to bring that up. Um, all he's ever going to show you is at least a neutral mood, if not a positive mood. And so after seeing that time and time and time again, you um, develop an idealized vision of this person, this persona um, Mm -hmm. that can't possibly hold up in reality. And in that sense, that makes the um, parasocial relationship that much more seductive because what that persona can offer you is an idealized friend. Um, Dave helped us out with this. And he said that um, the, the cheery game show host is, never has a bad day and snaps no. at you. And They're always there. I would caveat that with except Alex Trebek. But for the right. most part, <laughs> all the other ones wouldn't. They're always pleasant. They're always, like, nice to be around. And they're always making you feel good about yourself. That's one of the reasons parasocial relationships can be so strong. Should we take a break? Yes. All right. We'll be right back. Uh, all 
right. So let's talk about this. Um, we got the setup with Horton and Wall, and then since then, over the decades, things have been pretty interesting uh, as we've moved toward social media, which, again, we'll get to. But uh, the reason that we form bonds, it sounds like it might be a little weird, even though we've explained that it's quite natural. But it's it's evolutionary in nature. We've talked before plenty about the facts that uh, human beings – are hardwired to be social with one another because it helps in their survival. The ability to uh, read someone's tone or read someone's face was very valuable in the age of Tuk Tuk when they would approach like a new uh, people or something like a new persona. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also the fact that uh, it's it made Tuk Tuk feel good to have a friend. So we are hardwired to be social with one another, to pick up on social cues, and to have friends. And we do that, we pick up on the social cues largely from facial expressions and tone of voice, both of which come through loud and clear in um, TV close-ups, right? Exactly, for sure. So what's happening, and again, I don't think this was originally, I mean, no one invented TV to do this to people. It was like a Mm -hmm. surprise, but once people figured out it was going on, they exploited it as, as quickly as they could. But TV accidentally tricks you into thinking you're interacting with a really great person. And that they're interacting with you, and they kind of like you, so you like them back. Right, because your lizard brain, your evolutionary brain, doesn't know the difference between Dan Rather talking to your face on a television Mm -hmm. and Dan Rather really being in front of you in a Starbucks. Uh, You don't really know the difference. All you know is, you know, going back to your your brain goes back to Tuk Tuk's days, and you see a a kind face looking you in the eyeball telling you something uh, interesting or funny or what have you. Right. Exactly. So I, like you said, I'm in the 49% Mm -hmm. um, that uh, like just don't necessarily feel this way. And the reason why not everyone does this and that other people do it strong, more strongly than others, supposedly has to do with your natural levels of empathy, that the Mm -hmm. more you're able to take other people's perspectives onto your own, and just right. kind of imagine yourself in their shoes or understand their mm-hmm. struggles or the, just acknowledging the fact that they probably are struggling in some way or um, you're more likely to vibe on somebody in real life and on TV as well or in social media, as we'll see. I think you can be highly empathetic, though. I can be. It's just— um, To people that you know know and love. <laughs> no, <laughs> so I, maybe that's the difference. I, no, I mean, I can be to strangers, too, for sure. Um, I, I just don't know. There's, there's some— well, that's true. I didn't mean it like that. I just meant more. I see where you. I see the delineation in your mind. I, but that's I guess. the thing. I'm not aware of it. It feels like there's a short circuit between, you know, what I'm capable of, like in with people in real life and people not in real life. Like there's a disconnect right. between those two, and I'm not sure what it is or where it comes from. But I don't know. Yeah. I, because I do. I I like to think I'm fairly empathetic too. Yeah, for sure. I, want to uh, be I thought included. you were saying you weren't, so. <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, I mean, also, like, there's not a lot of, like, podcasts you listen to every day and stuff, is there? No, but, I mean, like, I watch a lot of helps. TV, too, and I don't have, like, a parasocial relationship with Jason Voorhees or anything. I, <laughs> I don't uh, – oh, boy, that reminds me. I just saw a very funny old Kamel Nanjiani bit mm-hmm. about uh, – well, you can look it up – about Jason and Freddie. It's probably not something I want to say on the air. Okay. But it's very funny. I, w- I want to know. Well, just Google it. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I'll wait well, until it was, after the show. How about that? Uh, I think I can summarize it best by saying that Freddy in the movie Freddy vs. Jason was racist at one point in one of his little Freddy lines mm-hmm. uh, because he talked about a, a person with of color uh, in a – made sort of a Freddy quip about it. Mm-hmm. And people, he was like, and people in the audience groaned. And he's like, they really, you know, it's okay that you're murdering children. <laughs> but like when you made a racist jab, like that's when we're not on Team Freddy right, anymore. Sure. It was pretty funny. Sure. Anyway, uh, where was I going with that though? What are you talking about? Uh, we Jason were, Voorhees? Yeah, we were moving on that, that like. Um, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I know what I was going to say is that I don't really have these with TV people. Podcasting specific is where I get my parasocial relationships. Yeah, from. and I'm uh, yeah, I, I I like I guess I don't know. Like I would say that like I listen to a, a lot of Terry Gross, and I've never been like Terry, and I would be great friends or 
you know, I like her. I think she's amazing. I think she's (laughs) one of the best interviewers walking around right now. But sure. Again, there's just that like she is on the radio. She's in Philadelphia. Like I, I've, I've never met her. I'll never meet her. Probably. You're like I've stood outside her house. Like those, those, (laughs) right? She would not come to the door. I know. Those qualifications like mean something to me subliminally that keep me from having a parasocial relationship. I think that's it. We're going to hammer this out one way or another by the end of this episode. (laughs) So uh, there's something called the compensation theory, and that is the idea that people who get in parasocial or who are more inclined to get in a parasocial relationship are compensating for a lack of real relationships in their life. The, like you sort of mentioned earlier, the, the trope of the, the lonely person who's socially awkward and doesn't have these relationships in real life. So they dream up a relationship with Conan O'Brien or whatever. Mm-hmm. And studies don't bear this out. Studies have shown that that's not the case. It's just not true. And in fact, they've shown the opposite, that people who are more extroverted and more likely to score higher on tests for interpersonal skills are mm-hmm. more likely to form these relationships, which it tracks for me. It makes sense. If you're more likely to be that way in a real relationship and in real life, then it seems like you would be more likely to do that parasocially. Yes, but it is controversial. Like there are definitely two schools of thought. One is that this is inherently a dangerous thing to do socially for Mm -hmm. yourself and for whoever the object of your parasocial relationship is. Um, And then other people are like, no, that's just, you guys are, like there's no data to back this up. Right. But that whole compensation theory, there's a model that that attempts to explain it called the addiction absorption model. And it basically uh, right. says that it, it it says that people who seek out um parasocial relationships essentially are get like like you were saying like they're awkward so they have to go find it somewhere else because there's mm-hmm. an inherent human drive to make connections so they're just making them with people they'll never meet in real life that they kind of idolize. And by doing that, they absorb the person's life. They absorb information about the person's life. Right. And effectively get addicted to it because it feels good to to be close to that person. And that, like any addiction, they develop a tolerance to a certain right. level of absorption. So they start getting further and further and deeper and deeper along into this addiction of their favorite person yeah. and uh, one day find themselves standing outside of Terry Gross's house, uh, hoping right. she'll come to the door. Um, that, it, that that's like, you will eventually reach that, that, that level if you follow this path long enough and that anybody, anyone who's engaged in a parasocial relationship is at risk of becoming that person that's stalking Terry Gross. I'm sorry, Terry right. Gross. I know. This is just working. So I'm going with it. And that is one camp. They've got the models, but they don't have data that says that. And in fact, yeah. the models are themselves are super questionable. The measures are super questionable. And it seems like that's just a really overstating, um, you know, the, the potential risks and dangers of this. That For I, most yeah. people, like you said, it's healthy. I think so, because if you're looking at a – if these numbers are a- accurate and you're looking at like a 3 to 5% rate of someone who takes things too far – where Terry Gross is, is like listening to uh, uh, oh God, what's her show? I'm totally blanking. Fresh Air. Fresh Air is the gateway drug, and then that's not enough. And then you need uh, you go out and get some fresh air in front of her house. <laughs> <laughs> Things can get troubling. That's the same thing as saying like anybody who ever takes a sip of alcohol is at risk. Mm for becoming an alcoholic. And exactly. Like, technically, th- these things are true because if you never took that sip of alcohol, you wouldn't be an alcoholic. But it's it's just, uh, I think it's a bit much. Right. Like, anyone who smokes a rock of crack is going to get addicted to crack. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, I, just a little more on that model. There's a kind of like the person at the center of the, yeah, it's a, a dangerous thing um, camp, seemingly is a psychologist named Lynn McCutcheon. Yeah, this was interesting. Lynn McCutcheon in 2002 came up with the Celebrity Attitude Scale, and that's Mm -hmm. not a measure of, like, which real housewife is more catty than the others. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Instead, it measures your attitude towards celebrities if you're engaged in parasocial relationships. And Lynn McCutcheon broke it out into basically three levels. And again, they believe that this is, like, a state, like, these are stages. This isn't, like, 
this person would never get to this stage. Like if you start at the first one, you're at risk of ending up in the third. Yeah, and this was, by the way, like 20 years ago, 21 years ago. So it wasn't a couple of years ago, which it sounds like it might be. Uh, but the, the three levels are the entertainment social level, uh, which uh, McCutcheon says is like almost everybody. And that's what we've been talking about when you just – it's all good and it's all fun and there's no weirdness going on. Uh, yeah. Then you get to intense personal, and that's when uh, you start to internalize the values of that person and consider them a soulmate – uh, those to me feel like disparate things. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty it, wide window. Because it, it, uh, when I first read it, that I was like, yeah, internalizing the values of like someone doing good things. It's like that's great, but putting that in the same category as considering their soulmate is a big stretch for me. <laughs> Agreed. Okay, and then the final level, uh, borderline pathological. That's the three to five percent, and that's when it's uh, what they call uh, celebrity worship. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one where. Um well, no. Okay, so borderline pathological is like the worst of it, but I think they're all celebrity worship, supposedly. And that became oh, really? a big problem. Yes. And that's problematic because um, some of oh, the yeah, people yeah, who are yeah, like, this, right. is not, this isn't like an actual, like you guys, there's no data suggesting that this is actually dangerous. They're saying and one of the big problems is you guys are inter- inter- interchanging the term fan with the term celebrity worshiper. Right. And yet you've never actually studied fans. Like, they've never applied the celebrity attitude scale to groups of fans. They just like applied it to, like, yeah. random co-eds who wanted, like, extra credit for their psychology class. Yeah. So when the, when a, a, a media psychologist named Gail Stever, or Stever, um, Gail and Lynn, it's like a It's Pat episode up in here. <laughs> um, so when, when Gail Stever uh, applied the celebrity attitude scale to a group of fans, like people who go to conventions and like who, the Bayhive like, or the yes. Swift uh, Swifties, yeah, or who who interact with other fans, um, people who've written letters to uh, a celebrity or something like that, like fans, mm-hmm. like above average fans, yeah. Um, they found that most of them didn't even rise to the criteria for that first entertainment social level, right. And that there is a definite distinction between being a fan and being a celebrity worshiper. And any fan could tell you that, but you can thank Gail Stever yeah. for uh, proving it. Yeah, so they're interrogating all these Swifties, and they're like, dude, you're being weird. I just think she's awesome <laughs> and like her music and uh, go to see her shows and, you know, fans get together and talk. Like, just uh, back off. You're being very strange. Right. But we wouldn't have a, a great pantheon of, of creepy movies if it weren't for that. Oh, yeah. You know, celebrity worship, the borderline oh, pathological. There's a lot of those, huh? Yes, but they may be generally made up. I'm not sure. Are any of them good? <sighs> what comes to mind is the Robert De Niro, Wesley Snipes one. Mm-hmm. Same here. Because we haven't even talked about sports. The one thing that you sent me that uh, is accurate is when you're at home screaming at a football player for dropping a pass or something, that's a parasocial interaction. Right. So that's a parasocial interaction. You can be knowing mad. Knowing that that player, knowing his wife's name and when they got married, that's right. the beginnings of a parasocial relationship. That's yeah. the distinction. Parasocial interaction can be um, cold out of just about anybody. Sure. Um, if you're into whatever you're watching, but that doesn't mean you're going to follow up after the game or the episode is over. Right. And don't ever talk back at the movie screen, although it can be funny. In the theater? Yeah. No, never. I mean, I don't do it, and I think it's rude, but I've also had a pretty good laugh or two when someone timed it out just right. My famous story about the witch in New York uh, that I won't repeat. Okay. I'll just tell, tell you what episode later. to go find I, it then. I forget stuff. You want to take uh, a second break? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. We'll, be, uh, we'll get back here in a minute, and we'll talk about some of the benefits, perhaps, and then the dark side right after this. Hey, oh, Okay, so uh, I think we kind of laid out that the, there's a really big disagreement on whether this is actually problematic or not. I kind of tend to lean in the camp that not, although for some people it can be. Okay? Yeah. I but agree. there's also like a whole other school of thought that this is actually helpful in some ways, in mm-hmm. some surprising ways too, but in ways that you would, um, you would probably guess like um, – that you are physically, emotionally, psychologically getting a benefit out of that parasocial relationship. That if you have a favorite podcast 
and favorite podcasters. And when you listen to them, you feel like you're hanging out with your friends. You're receiving positive benefits from that. And as long as you're not replacing real life friends yeah. with podcast friends, because your real life friends are bothering you, they bug you, you're, you're, you're getting basically nothing but benefit from it. Yeah. And some of the other like specific benefits are examples of where, uh, and you see this more and more these days with, um, well, with all kinds of people, actors and pop stars and stuff talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, people have, many, many, many people have sought treatment for themselves because their favorite singer has been open and honest about an eating disorder or a mental uh, challenge. Um, I think Dave used the example of Katie Couric years ago when she, uh, her husband uh, died of colon cancer, mm -hmm. and she did a broadcast where she got a colonoscopy, and the rate of people getting colonoscopies jumped after that. So it, it literally can help people uh, be physically and mentally healthier because they're taking a cue. Like, they may not want to listen to their friend who says, hey, you, you should get some help, but they'll listen to uh, uh, Edie Brickell. <laughs> what? Say, wow! I don't know how that happened, but don't even uh, question it. Just go with or it. Or Billie Eilish and no, Edie Brickell. No, Edie Brickell. All right, Edie Brickell. Say, you know, you should uh, you should seek help if you're having struggles with a certain thing. Uh, okay, yes, that's a benefit for for all too, right? And that doesn't mean that you're like you're just doing what the celebrity you like tells you to. Uh, there's a certain amount of, I think, just raising awareness that isn't accounted sure. for in that as well. Um, also, supposedly, having a parasocial relationship with somebody in an outgroup from you can mm -hmm. actually create feelings of empathy toward yes. real life members of that outgroup. Totally. There was a two, 2020 study published in Communications Research that um, had participants watch 10 weeks of um, a show that mm -hmm. featured um, LGBTQ plus people as outgroup people. Mm -hmm. And over the 10 weeks, most of the people developed at least an affinity for the outgroup people. Um, but some people actually developed parasocial relationships with them. And the groups that were the most prejudiced against gay people going into the study uh -huh. had the most growth and actually had lower, um, lessened attitudes of prejudice toward gay people after the study because they were exposed to gay people through TV, through these characters that they developed some form of parasocial relationship with. Yeah. So, like, uh, well, I usually don't like uh, homosexuals, but uh, after watching, after being forced to watch Six Feet Under, Keith and Michael's story was so sweet. <laughs> yeah. And I just really love those guys. That happens. And that's why, and that's one reason why representation matters. Just one reason. Go ahead. So, uh, Chuck, speaking of gay love stories, I yes. saw, have you seen The Last of Us? I'm sure you have. Yeah, yeah. I played the game as well. I was way oh. into it. So, the the I think episode three. The best. Nick Offerman. Just amazing, dude. Yeah. It is so amazing. So, if you have a relative who um, is uh, homophobic, mm -hmm. just start watching the, the Last of Us. With and them. they like and guns? Episode, yeah. <laughs> and hate zombies. And yeah. episode three will spring on them, and before they know it, they'll love gay people for the rest of their lives. It's amazingly well done. Well, you know, the story there is in the game, there is a just one brief mention of uh, the the partner. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of his name now. Who Nick Frank Offerman played. Yeah, Bill there's only was Offerman. Yeah, there's only one mention of Frank when he just says something in the game about like, yeah, I lost my partner a year ago, something, something. And it you don't even know when you're playing the game if it was like a business partner or whatever. And then when they made the TV show, they said, Hey, this is like a chance to go off script and to build a richer world and to like yeah. make this great episode of this aw awesome backstory. Yeah. And it was you know, hailed as like one of the best T V episodes of the year of like any show. Yes. It's so it's, good. Amazing. Nick Offerman just, just did such a great job. Yeah, and the other guy from uh, White Lotus. God, he's so good. What's I've never name? seen him before. I've not watched that show. Oh, I think you would like White Lotus. I've heard. I've heard. I've heard. You, yeah. <laughs> uh, Murray, uh, what's his name? Abraham. Murray something? F. Murray Abraham. No, Murray uh, Bartlett. He's fantastic. Okay. All right. Has he been in anything else besides White Lotus I might have seen him in? Because I really uh, didn't recognize him, but he had a pretty thick beard. I don't know. 
He's so good at White Lotus, though. Okay, I'll check uh, it out. Check he's, it out. He's been in other stuff, and he's certainly, like, probably more busy than he's ever been now because of those roles. Um, okay, so where were we, Chuck? We were talking about... Well, some of the benefits, too. Um, oh, yeah. One thing that we've seen over the years is that uh, you're not weird as a, you know, 40-something-year-old person to not have a parasocial relationship because... Generally speaking, teens and adolescents are more uh, likely to have these than adults do. Uh, and for teens, it can be kind of like we said before. If there's, if uh, Edie Brickell is telling a teen about her struggles with something, uh, it's a really big deal for a, a teen or an adolescent to know that they're not alone, that they can seek help, and they're not weird because their favorite person, their favorite singer, also has the same thing. Right. That's incredibly beneficial. Yeah. I mean, to help kids that are just feel completely isolated and make totally. them feel less alone. Also, um, apparently this is an explanation for um, the trope of young girls, like pre-adolescent and adolescent girls, having crushes on, like, um, Scott Bayo or sure. um, who else that's not a jerk? Um, the Bay City Rollers. Yeah, the Bay City Rollers, of course. Everybody went through that. Uh, that they're actually like they're, the parasocial relationship helps them kind of explore uh, what a real relationship is going to be like, what their expectations are, what their wants are, what their needs yeah. are. You're testing what kind out of that. hair they yeah. want their, their <laughs> significant other to have. Your Bay City Rollers hair. Yeah, for sure. The, AKA the best hair. Yeah. I, I said that because uh, I remember when I was a kid, very specifically, I have a memory of uh, we had a babysitter over one night. And the babysitter was a girl that was older than my sister. So my sister must have been pretty young because she's six years older than me, and she mm -hmm. usually was the babysitter by that point. Mm -hmm. But I remember them sitting around with the Bay City Rollers record and spinning it around and dropping their finger on the album. And whichever, you know, roller that their finger landed nearest to was the one that they would fall in love with. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a memory of that when I was like five years old or something. It's very funny. Yeah. Did it just blow your mind or were you like, what is this crud? Uh, no, I got it. And, you know, I famously had a, my very first crush was uh, Christy McNichol, uh, who is gay. So I don't know what that says about me. What was she in? Aiden, is it enough? No, she was in, uh, God, I mean, she was in movies and stuff. She was sort of uh, just the cute girl next door when we were, well, I, I'm older than you, but when I was a kid. No, I remember. I, I just don't remember what she was in. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of something. I mean, she was in movies and stuff like Little Darlings and stuff that I wasn't allowed to watch. Uh, <laughs> but I think she was on a, a TV show too. Yeah. I, I'm familiar with her. I can't remember what. I swear oh, Family. Me. That was it. She was on that okay. TV show, Family. See, that's why I thought it was Eight is Enough. It's basically yeah. the same thing. Exactly. There just weren't eight of them, I think. So, again, can be very beneficial, usually very harmless. There is a dark side. That's not to say that there isn't – that that parasocial relationships can't go wrong or that they can be harmful or it can't be harmful. And one of the, one of the ways that – I said that media is built on itself over and over again. Yeah, you ain't kidding. Going from radio to TV – TV, apparently another big uh, crest of this uh, was when reality shows came along. Yep. Made people even more connected to the people on the screen. And then social media came along. And that is, it's, it's almost like it was designed to get into your brain and be like, this person is legitimately your friend. Yeah. They liked your post. They may even like DM back and forth with you. They might respond to your email. They know who you are. They're your friend. And yeah. for, at that point, it being that realistic, it can trick you in, into forgetting that they, they aren't your friend. They don't really know you. And um, this is a parasocial relationship, especially, especially for developing minds. Yeah, absolutely. Because all of a sudden, you have 24-7 access, depending on how active someone is in social media, mm -hmm where they are really sharing their life. And you see a post by someone and you think, oh my gosh, I have a, a black uh, Maine Coon cat too. And I have that same tile in your bathroom. You're getting these little, little glimpses. And I mentioned tile because I did the same thing. I saw Melissa McCarthy post something one time and I had the same tile that she did. And I 
like a dope, thought, oh, my God, we have the same taste. We would be such good friends. <laughs> well, she's a huge TikTok influencer, so I'm sure that happens to lots of people. Oh, is she really? No. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I've never been on TikTok. I see her more on Instagram. Yeah, sure. Uh, but it they classify it as unhealthy when it's, it disrupts your life, when it disrupts your daily life, day to day. And if it's damaging or replacing your real life relationships, uh, that's when it's – if you're spending money, like the furthest extreme is when all of a sudden you're, you've quit your job because you have to go live in the city where this person is. Or you're spending a lot of money collecting uh, expensive memorabilia or buying them gifts and sending them. Mm -hmm. That's where it gets into the potential stalker realm. Yes, or that um, you threaten self harm if they don't respond yeah. to you, or um, yeah, there's it can be, it can get problematic. And again, this is exceedingly rare. I don't think it's like a, a huge thing to to lose sleep over as like no. say a parent or a concerned person, um, but it can happen. And again, that just the combination of social media and uh, at developing brains. It, it, it's just so dangerous in so many different ways and so potentially harmful in so many different ways. And this is one of those ways that it can happen. One of the other, I think, risk factors is is it is possible to kind of let your in real life um, relationships dwindle mm -hmm. as because you're putting more and more focus and energy into your parasocial yeah. relationship. And that also is kind of like a self-defeating thing because there's fewer people to kind of pull you back toward reality and say like, no, 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 we're your friends. That person is an influencer, doesn't even know you exist. So let's go get some ice cream and play um, uh, Fortnite while we do. Right. <laughs> right? That's, a, that's a nice call up. You're not even a gamer. No, I'm not. But I've heard of Fortnite before on TV. Uh, so there's an article that Dave found that is – Really interesting and, and good, I think, uh, from The Guardian from a couple of years ago by Rachel uh, Aroesti, I guess, uh, called Tragic But True, colon, How Podcasters Replaced Our Real Friends. And Rachel makes a very strong case that podcasting has even up the game even more, parasocially speaking. Um, mm -hmm. And COVID really helped with that because uh, during COVID, when people were uh, locked in and they weren't seeing their friends face to face anymore, they would have uh, Zoom meetings and phone calls with uh, – certainly with their business associates, but also with friends. I, I mean, I did this a few times where I would get on a Zoom with a friend from out of town or even in town. And all of a sudden, uh, podcasting increased. Uh, I think 51% oh, yeah. uh, of podcast listeners say they first started listening during the pandemic, and it grew 40% from 2019 to 2022. Uh -huh. So not only are more people listening, but they're listening in this very – intimate way uh and you know people are in their ear holes and you're looking and interacting the same way you were on like a zoom because you were robbed of contact with your friends so it was right. basically there was nothing to distinguish the two except well, talking back what a weird turn of events too for sure um but the thing is is so the i think that title is very misleading because if you read it she's not actually really lamenting it she's more just kind of documenting it yeah, I think. And she also makes the point that um, this was at a time during the pandemic, during like lockdowns, where you were physically unable to interact with friends and podcasts made a pretty great substitute for a while. Yeah. Um, and that that in and of itself makes it um, less harmful. I might be a little biased, <laughs> but uh -huh. um, I do think that, yes, being in people's ears is uh, one of those triggers like the looking at people uh, in the camera was with TV early on. Like, it's a it's very, very intimate to let somebody, to let their voice be in your mind and basically take over your your mind for that period of time. And that's, of course, what we're doing, everybody. We're experimenting. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the other thing, too, is podcasting is, um, they found this great uh, honors thesis, uh, by someone named um, Michaela Nadora from Portland State University a few years ago called Parasocial Relationships with Podcast Hosts, mm -hmm. where Michaela even references Stuff You Should Know, which is very, very great. She The whole thing is about Stuff You Should Know, all 30-something pages. Yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, her sending this to us when she, um, when she published. Oh, that's right. God, I totally remember that now. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of, pod, uh, a lot of theses, actually. 
interestingly. But the whole upshot is that with podcasting, uh, anyone can do it. You have to have a, a small amount of equipment and the internet, and it's not like – you have to, uh, you know, go through the trials and tribulations of someone auditioning for a role to eventually get on TV mm-hmm. and stuff like that, and then you're a big star. It's like it's a low barrier to entry, and that means that there's going to be a lot of just sort of everyday people and regular schmoes like you and I mm-hmm. uh, doing this, and that lends itself even more to people thinking, like, of course we're friends. Like, I'm not going to be friends with Carrie Bradshaw or, or Sarah Jessica Parker because they're just so fabulous. But Chuck and Josh are just normies like us, so right. we would be friends. Norm core to the max. We are. Uh, another thing that Michaela and Adora um, kind of sussed out as a trigger or cue is that a lot of times people listen to podcasts alone. A lot of people listen and listen to them with other people, but for the I would say the vast majority mostly of alone, people I think, yeah. listen to them alone. But they're also listening to them uh, while they're doing ac- other activities like vacuuming or commuting or going to the grocery store. So it's like we're along for the ride. We're keeping you company while you're doing all this stuff. We're just sitting in the back seat having a conversation that you're listening to while you drive us to the grocery store. Right. And also, as we have done over the years, and especially, you know, there are all kinds of podcasts, but they found that the ones I've, you know, it makes sense with the strongest parasocial bonds are ones like this, where it's sort of people chatting, conversational, usually comedy, uh, and not like a, a dramatic, um, like, I don't know, true crime, I guess. They can have that angle if the hosts are, have a lot of personality. Yeah, like or Ka- soap Ka- operas. Karen in Georgia. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, with shows like the ones that we do, you talk inevitably about our lives and a house project we're doing, or Momo, or mm-hmm. Nico and Charlie, or uh, Yumi and Emily, or Ruby. And people get invested because they know this stuff about us and they know they feel like they know these people like who who gets the biggest applause at any live show when emily and yumi are there mm-hmm. emily and yumi people mm-hmm. are thrilled when they're there and ruby was at her first live show in atlanta and people were just like i mean people were kind of staring at her and i didn't get creeped out because people <laughs> were being super sweet and friendly and they thought it was so sweet that she was at her first show uh-huh. but people hear these stories and i get it because i do the same thing with my podcast hosts that I love. And it, it all just makes sense. Like uh, recalling jokes and um, people have, especially with us, have lived 15, 16 years with us. And that right. whole thing where people get mad when their favorite celebrity couple gets a divorce. Like it's it's so weird to think about. But Emily and I get mad when Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins split up. And if Emily and I got divorced, people would... <laughs> hate my guts that listen to this show. So, yeah, I I think what she, she kind of sums all that up in is that that's one of the benefits of having a long-running podcast or listening to a long-running podcast. Is that's right. Little by little, all that stuff comes out, and you become enmeshed in the, the other that host's life. Like, you know what's going on in their life, and that's exactly what you do with friends. You know what's going on in their life. You know uh, their dog's name and that their dog is great and you know their wife's name and their wife is great. You just know this stuff. And it's uh, just another way that that media is tricking our brains, which are programmed to seek social connections, into thinking, oh, I've got a social connection going on. This is pretty great. Right. And people don't know that I can be very moody and passive aggressive. Like <laughs> e- even in a podcast medium like this where it is real – for the most part, uh, you don't want to show that stuff on the air. <laughs> you put your best self forward, even in a medium like this. Right. That's why they coined that term persona or persona, because, yeah, that's it's just n- no one does that. Maybe um, what was that horrible punk guy who used to eat his own poop on stage? Gigi Allen. Yes. Maybe Gigi Allen would do that if he were still alive <laughs> and had a podcast. But for the most part, no, anybody, no no matter who it is, is going to, at the very least, put some semblance of their best self forward. Even if it's not 100%, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's made up. It's that you're holding some stuff back because it's just you don't share that with people you've never met before. And in that sense, we the hosts are aware that you can form a parasocial relationship with yeah. us. We can't do that with you. So that inherently makes us slightly guarded to some degree or another, and creates, for you guys, a persona 
that is an idealized version of us. But here's the thing. I, if I talk about being passive aggressive or moody, mm -hmm. that ramps up the relationship mm -hmm. because people can identify with that. I just can't be that to you on the air. Yeah, totally. Because then people would witness it, the actual act of it and say, oh, geez, Chuck can be a real moody jerk sometimes. I know. It'd be like the crossword puzzle all over again. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I'm kidding, dude. Great that episode. So Man, that got everybody <laughs> upset, you know? Yeah. Like, she they were did. like, what is going on? Like, is this the end of Stuff You Should Know? Oh, I know. I think I took my enthusiasm for crosswords and got weird. Oh, it was fine. I think I it's know. a classic app. It was a good one, too. But, I mean, the fact that it has just that <laughs> little ball of weirdness in there, I love sure. it. It's classic Stuff You Should Know. Uh, I mean, that's all I got. I think it's super interesting For stuff. sure. This is a, what made you choose this one that I'm sure everybody wants to know because they'll feel closer to you if you tell them. I don't – Dave might have actually thought of this. Or no, oh, maybe, really? I, maybe I just saw it because I didn't even know this was a term. Uh, I, I've, I've lived it on both sides, but I never knew people studied it. So uh, I don't know. Maybe that's where it came from. I just saw the words and I was like, oh, wait, that's me both times. Chuck both ways. There you go. That comes after the colon from parasocial relationship. It's Chuck both ways. Yeah, like a fine dish in a great restaurant. <laughs> All right. Sure. You never had that, like scallop two ways or whatever? That's the thing. I made salad four ways. Chicken oh, salad. Wow. <laughs> uh, s like a nichoise salad. Okay. Um, what were the other two? Oh, one was like a, a corn and bean salad. Okay. Sounds good. And then there was another one. And I was like, my God, I made four salads. Yeah. All in one meal? There was a lot of leftover salad, but it was good. Salad four ways. I like it. I, when I came over, you only made me three salads, so I'm a little <laughs> salty. I was holding back. I was still perfecting the fourth one. All right. I'll make that fourth one for you some other time. Please. Well, um, I feel like we're done with this episode. You said that's all you got. It's all I've got. I'm done talking about salad, so that means it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this inspiration. Uh, hey, guys. I want to reach out and say that I love your show. My husband discovered it, showed it to me. I haven't stopped listening since. Uh, when I was a stay-at-home mom feeling lonely, I would turn on the show and feel like I was having a conversation with friends. That's funny. I didn't even pre-read this one. No Look way. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and Kinley says, parentheses, in the least creepy way possible. Nice. Always good to include that. Yeah. Uh, your show even gave me the inspiration and idea to write a daily true crime calendar as a way for me to share my interests with others just like you. In fact, several days in my calendar are inspired by some of your episodes uh, by getting this idea from you to work on the calendar, it helped me through uh, postpartum anxiety wow. and helped me feel like I was helping to provide for my new little one. Uh, I would love to show you my appreciation by sending you each a copy of my calendar. If you would like one, just reply. Send my address. Uh, so, hey, you can send it. Here's my home address. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so grateful I was able to discover the show because I wouldn't be where I would uh, am now if I hadn't. Keep doing the good work. And I look forward to hearing from you. And that is from Ken Lee. Ken Lee? Yeah, Kinley, and I... Kinley. Uh, 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 yeah, I want one of these uh, true crime calendars. I love a daily calendar. I just need to send Kinley uh, the address. Yeah, same here. So uh, please spell Kim, Kim Lee or Kinley's name. Uh, K-I-N-L-E-Y. Kinley. Kinley. Oh, yeah, like Mount McKinley, but without the Mount or the Mitch. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Kinley, thank you so much for that email. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, we love hearing stuff like that. So we're glad we could help in some way. And I'd love a calendar too. Uh, if you want to be like Kinley and get in touch with us, you can send us an email as well. Send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.